right, I think we can go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone to our first ever panel on community engagement brought to you by the LTR network, DI committee, and specifically the community engagement working group. Um, we have a fantastic panel from people from all over the LTR network, the Long-Term Ecological Research Network, um, here to talk about community engagement um, from their sites and, and what that means to us, um, and kind of just speaking to a wide range of, of communities that we all work with in our day-to-day -day work. Um, so without taking up too much time, I'd like to kind of give the panelists some time to introduce themselves, and then afterwards, We'll have Q&A, so please, as we're going through, use the Q&A function to enter your questions, and you can upvote questions so that we can kind of prioritize which questions we should ask the panelists. Um, yeah, so without further ado, why don't we start with um, Elena and your introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to be a panelist, and thank you for attending. Um, I'm Elena Bautista Sparrow. I'm the Education Outreach Coordinator at the Bonanza Creek LTER in Fairbanks, Alaska. I'm also a Research Professor of Soil Microbiology and Education Outreach Director at the International Arctic Research Center at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. I acknowledge the land that the University of Alaska Fairbanks is on and honor the Lower Tanana Dene people who have cared for this unceded land for ages. Our research is conducted in a number of sites that encompass a variety of landscapes. And so I also acknowledge the many other Alaska Native nations upon whose unceded ancestral lands our research program resides because they have been in relationship for thousands of years, the indigenous people uh, in relationship with the boreal forest of interior Alaska we, the members of our LTR program, strive to learn about, value, and be mindful of this relationship in our research and our actions, and to strive for collaborative community decision making. So, uh, one thing that was unique about our uh, site is we don't have a structure, a main place where everybody can come in and, and stay there and, you know, while they do their research because we have so many different uh, sites, uh, there's not one site. And so we have the Bonanza Creek Experimental Forest, which is taiga forest of interior Alaska. We have the regional site network, which encompasses three major ecoregions of interior Alaska, the Ray Mountains, the Tanana Klasko Queen Lowlands, and the Yukon Tanana Uplands. And then there's the Eight Mile Lake uh, study, which is an upland tundra, and as well as the Alaska peatland experiment or at the apex, these are peatland sites near the Bonanza experimental forest. And um, the communities we engage with are, you know, besides the university researchers uh, for collaboration, federal and state agencies, general public, Alaska native communities, educators, formal and informal, K-16 students, grads, students, and postdoctoral fellows. And in the general public, we have also engaged, there's a program uh, that uh, Mary Beth Lee has been very active in for many years, uh, engaging artists, painters, poets, authors, sculptors, dancers, you know, in the research and appreciation and interpretation of uh, the research that we do and communication. Uh, and so that's it. I'm going to pass it on to uh, Era. Yeah, go ahead, R and Kim. <laughs> and Hi, Kim, I'm, uh, yes. Era <laughs> yeah, Winner, I apologize about the backlight. We're in the office, so it's very terrible, and I don't look great today because of it. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I am an eco-statistician and data manager for BEMP, which is part of the Sovieta Schoolyard Program. Hi everyone, Kim Eichhorst, uh, she, her, and I am Science and Research Director for BEMP and also the Education Outreach um, Coordinator for Savieta and um, Research Faculty at uh, University of New Mexico. I go by Hugh in case you need to refer to that. Sorry, I forgot. Oh, I always forget that. 
And our, our um, BEM science and our education takes place on the current and ancestral lands of the Pueblo, Diné, Apache, and other displaced indigenous people. And we like to acknowledge that this land was forcibly stolen by European colonizers and that the detrimental effects of their presence through violence, displacement, and disease are still impactful today. So we offer this acknowledgement as a first step in honoring the indigenous people and their ancestors and our call toward further learning and actions as guests in this place. And uh, what's the new thing about our sites? Um, so BEMP or the Bosque Ecosystem Monitoring Program is the schoolyard program for the Savieta LTER. And um, we have sites that span um, 350 miles of the river and we involve K-12 students and their teachers in the actual monitoring of these sites. Um, and then we also engage with federal and state agencies um, and other researchers in um, providing the data and using the data to make management decisions in the riparian forest and along the uh, Rio Grande. So it, I know, I think it makes sense. Um, Perfect, thank you so much. And up next we have Danielle Ignace. Hi everyone, it's great to be here today. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this uh, wonderful panel discussion. And I'm sure we have a ton to, to say about each one of our LTER sites. So hopefully we can get through as many questions as we can. So I'm Danielle Ignace. I am joining you today from UBC, University of British Columbia in Vancouver which is um, the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And so despite being far away, I'm here to uh, be a speaking member and, and representative for the Harvard Forest LTER site. Um, let's see, I, yeah, I'm an ecophysiologist. I'm an assistant professor in forest and conservation sciences. I'm also a member of the Coeur d'Alene tribe, which is in Northern Idaho, and also Menominee, which is in Northern Wisconsin. So I have a, a long history of traveling from different ecosystem types in the Southwest in Arizona to Massachusetts um, in 2012, which, I, which is where I started uh, working with collaborators at Harvard Forest. And I got really involved in the, um, the RU uh, summer program um, and just really kind of fell in love with, with the idea of having these, these big group projects as, as a part of that. So, I've been involved in Harvard Forest since then, um, and really uh, both in the virtual and the in-person setting. I'm super excited to actually be there in person this summer in uh, three weeks. So very exciting times. Um, and you can find me at Massachusetts uh, throughout the summer. So I love Harvard Forest. It's in Peter Sam, Massachusetts. It was established in 1907, has been part of the LTER um, network since 1988. It is 4,000 acres on unceded Nipmuc land. So that is uh, the focus uh, of what I, I will be talking about today, which is establishing, um, you know, respectful, reciprocal, and productive relationship with uh, important members of the Nipmuc community. And I think we've come a long way in, in the past couple of years. And I think there's a lot to do still. Um, Harvard Forest is really fantastic because there is a uh, central location. It, it is a little bit out of, in the middle of nowhere, right? It's not on Harvard campus uh, in Cambridge. So it is in Petersand, Massachusetts. It includes a classroom, a laboratory, research facilities. Uh, there's always a, a really good chef on site all summer long. So it really does help establish this nice community we have good food and we have these wonderful cohorts of the RU students that come in every summer. And of course, it's just a wonderful place to collaborate uh, with researchers from all over who want to do their, their work at Harvard Forest. And um, I'll, I'll leave it at that and, and happy to answer all of your questions. And I'll pass it off to Barbara. Hi, everyone. Um, Barbara Brown Wilson, uh, she, her, hers pronouns and um, uh, I'm a part of the Virginia uh, Coastal um, Research LTR, and I would say that what probably we've, the um, LTER has been in existence since 1987, but what I um, bring that's probably unique is I'm actually new to it through uh, coastlines and people um, 
hub. So I'm the um, I'm a researcher who's based in the Charlottesville campus at UVA, and I run the um, UVA Equity Center. So we really do community engaged scholarship as the primary thing we do. That's all about the redress of inequity, and we work predominantly with. Um, local black and brown communities really trying to honor the, the harm done by the university for the past 200 years and um, have now been working um, with wonderful partners like the um, Virginia Coastal LTER and others across the state um, to just, uh, you know, kind of embed those same models of um, of uh, co-production into the into the work, and so happy to be here representing a group that I, I believe in really uh, strongly and has been doing amazing work for a really long time. But I'm I'm the new kid for sure. Oh, and I teach urban and environmental planning. Thank you, Barbara. And up next, we have Shanae Madison from the Minneapolis St. Paul LTR. Great. Hey, happy to be here. Um, my name is Shanae. Uh, I use she, her pronouns, and I am with uh, one of the newer LTER sites. So Minneapolis St. Paul is an urban LTER site that encompasses uh, the Twin Cities metro area, uh, which importantly is also Dakota Makoche, uh, the occupied homelands of the Dakota people uh, who are still here uh, and leading some of the most exciting work uh, in this region to reclaim and reconnect land and language and culture. Um, researchers with our LTER program come from the University of Minnesota, St. Thomas, the USDA Forest Service, uh, and numerous other institutions and community organizations. Um, they study uh, biophysical and social sciences and how urban stressors affect ecological structure and functioning of urban nature, um, pollinators, urban forests, urban watersheds, lakes and streams. Um, and also something that may be kind of unique uh, about our LTER is that we also have a number of social scientists in our uh, research community who are looking specifically at how disparities um, in who benefits from urban nature uh, and how uh, have arisen and how those disparities um, can be overcome. Uh, and that gets us into talking about community engagement with a real attention to issues around race, social class, culture. Um, I come to the LTER uh, project, uh, I'm not a researcher, <laughs> uh, I'm not an academic, uh, I have an undergraduate degree in history of science and cultural studies, um, but I am a cultural community organizer and so for the last 10 or 15 years I've been working kind of between uh, ecological researchers with within the university and other institutions, um, and then also with community organizations. Um, specifically as a non-native person working uh, to support indigenous cultural resurgence here and language revitalization and also as an artist who's really interested in how culture shapes so much about um, how we make policy or how we do research. So I'm working with our LTER, specifically our community engagement team, um, which is really looking at the impacts and potentials of community engaged research. And so we're really early in our LTER program. We've only been around for about a year, um, but what we're doing is really focusing on relationship building because relationships are the basis of everything we do. Um, and it takes time um, and it takes trust. And especially as I'm sure you all know, um, when you're dealing with uh, historical harms that have been done by the university research, um, a colonial research paradigm. So we're, we're working on um, developing our relationships with community partners in the Dakota community, uh, as well as working with um, an organization called Yo Mama's House, which was started by um, a black activist and artist, Amake Kubat. And those community organizations and others are really um, working to shape how we develop the culture of our LTER. Um, and I'm there to kind of ask those questions, help build those relationships, um, and then really try to, try to carve out more space for community leadership um, so that it shapes the questions we ask and how we ask them and not just how we communicate uh, the research findings. And there's a lot more that I could say about that, but I, I want to get into the question. So thanks again. Um, I'm really excited to be joining you all and talking about, about this. Wonderful. We're so excited to hear from you all. And um, we're excited to see that questions are coming in. So we're go I'm going to interweave them uh, with some of the prepared questions we have. 
So the first question I want to ask you all is, what does community engagement mean to you? What is the purpose and the form that it takes, uh, particularly as you as individuals have um, perhaps reasons and meanings, but also your institutions might have a reason why they engage? So how does that alignment or misalignment um, result in how uh, this community engagement takes place? So anybody? Okay. So I'll I'll take I'll take it. So I I because we have a gamut of audiences that we work uh, communities that we work with, I'll address the one that I uh, you know personally have been involved in. And this is the K K16. And so we have programs working with educators, formal and informal, uh, who work not only in the uh, in Fairbanks, the, you know, more urban area, but in rural sites. And so we're interested in reaching underserved, marginalized communities, um, uh, students. And so, so our, our, um, um, our aim for what, what does it mean is it is, as mentioned by our, uh, by Shanai, that, you know, it's building relationships what do they need instead of us saying, here's what we're gonna do for you, ask them what do they need? And they, the, the students are interested in, of course, STEM learning and their elders and their you know, community members want that for them. And also because we're working with schools, that's the aim, but how do we do this? And you know, centering inclusion in our work, how do we, um, how do we make it so that we honor what they have started learning, how they've started learning and building on that. Uh, you know, so building on indigenous knowledge and how do we braid and weave that uh, with, with the other uh, Western science that we're bringing, but also, yeah, doing that. Thank you. Go for it, Art. Thank you. Um, so actually BEMP was, founded on um, the idea of community engagement. And I'm gonna give all of the credit really to um, Cliff Crawford, who was our co-founder. Um, and his vision was not just um, students, but, but all of the communities, getting them involved in, in actually monitoring the sites and learning about the ecology, but then also communicating back to um, the rest of their communities. And that really, we have shifted the focus really on um, K-12 students and university students. But that, that notion of bringing in community to then learn about and disseminate to their community has been um, part of our, our huge success locally. And, and in particular, what we've learned from, from Cliff um, was he was, as Elena said, he was a listener. So he, he was able to talk with groups that were actively suing each other over different um, endangered species issues or water use issues. Um, but because he would listen and he was so respectful and he would very carefully um, take what he heard and learn from it. Um, so a lot of our early sites um, that engagement in the community was because people um, trusted Cliff, whether it was three of our Pueblo sites um, we have because they asked them to come, like, will you establish this site here and help us learn what's happening from our restoration projects. Um, but they did it because they trusted Cliff. And our fourth Pueblo site was because finally them had its own name. Um, but it was really that um, engagement with the same with our federal and state data users. Um, our partners, again, had that communication channel um, and trusted the science that was coming out of them. Um, but in part because Flip taught us all to listen, like what are your needs? What is it that we need to be monitoring? How is it that we need to be analyzing data um, so, that, so that it's relevant and not just us learning and kind of trying to distribute what we've learned and not really addressing the needs of the communities. Yeah, I, 
it's that being invited in mindset as opposed to the typical academic approach of yeah saying you all need this which is like the totally wrong thing to do and that take, can often take years uh, but it's yeah that listening and invitation mindset is super important yeah, Shana. Yeah, um, I'm glad you brought it. I mean, everybody, I think, has mentioned something along the lines of trust and the, the need to have those kind of trusting relationships. And that's something that, you know, as a community engagement team through our LTER, we're really looking at the spectrum of community engagement that already exists among the researchers within the project, and then trying to find ways to encourage um, practices like what you're talking about, you know, if there are things that have worked particularly well for a given community group or researcher in terms of how to work together or relationships that have been built, how can we encourage that kind of a transformation in practice across the LTER? So it's like a really slow approach. And, it, and a lot of times what we end up doing is just changing the way that we do things as a team, you know, recognizing that culture shapes you know, that often the university and these kinds of research projects center whiteness or white supremacy type of culture and that that automatically shapes the way that then we would go and connect with an in community. And so we're kind of turning things on their head a lot um, and finding ways to do our meetings differently or approach um, how we build a, you know, a, a group of advisors from within the community to shape the way that we think about our work as researchers, so. Um, I have a follow-up question. So all of us, all of our sites and all of us um, engage with institutions that if we think of the histories um, have engaged in a lot of past harms. So how does that history um, come into play in your community engaged work? How do you address it? And has this resulted in changing the ways that you engage or perhaps you don't engage uh, with some members of your community? Barbara? Um, so uh, I think just to also bring in your first question, I think for University of Virginia, a lot of our reckoning with the past harms we've done, you know, beyond just a verbal reckoning, um, has been after the Unite the Right rally of um, uh, August 2017, where many um, of our people were, you know, uh, physically uh, really harmed by the terrorists. And, um, uh, and of course, those of us doing community engaged work have been deeply aware that Charlottesville is one of the most um, inequitable places in the country in terms of social mobility rates and other things and, and that the university as the major employer and the major landowner and the major healthcare provider and all those things has a has a role um not only you know and historically as, as a landscape of enslavement but also today um, um as uh, and all those roles and so we really have been working very hard to figure out what it would look like if we were um actively participating in um repair in addition to being really great neighbors that um, which means research sovereignty it means really a, a redistribution of power and of resources and so at the equity center um, as i said we were originally focused very um, locally but um but have have been able through the sort of co-production of a lot of our systems with local activists and, and leaders have now um, been able to, to kind of create models that that we've we've found really amazing um, resident leaders in the Eastern Shore where um, where this LTER is that we're doing very similar work in addition to you know like the the um, Cora Baird is from um, the Eastern Shore as well so a lot of the LTER staff team is is also um, native but uh, I'll I'll put a little honorarium guide that um, you all might find useful or have actually better versions of so I would I'd welcome um, critique or engagement with it but we've it's been helpful for us as a way to really translate how you would value people's time and and if their knowledge was being valued at the same level as um, as the the sort of traditional credentialized scholar so that's how we're trying to push on the system thank you Daniel 
Yeah, thanks. I just to address the first question, uh, I won't uh, repeat what anyone has said. I, I definitely um, agree with the lessons and principles that have been stated about the relationship building. And just to add um, some other thoughts to that about what community engagement means to me or, or those of us that are, are thinking about this at Harvard Forest, I, I think a few things come to mind. One is that maintaining the relationship and that if you have a summer program, it can be kind of like a fleeting thing, right? And I and I think what's so important is to have some sort of maintenance or group, you know, administrative support, you know, some something in place that so it helps to maintain that over time, even though students might come and go, um, and even researchers. So I think that's important. Um, I think pushing boundaries as well. That you know we think about long term research. What does that really mean? Are we really being very inclusive with the long-term research. So uh, engaging the community, I think, is is the one of the most important keys to really understanding long-term ecological research, um, as well as kind of trying to step outside of this bubble of standard kind of experimentation and observations you make in the field, as well as the publications and knowledge sharing that comes out of that. Um, and also, I think patience in realizing that relationship building and community engagement is not on the same timeline. If you even wanna have it on the timeline, does not match with academic timelines, deadlines for grants and funding and things like that. So I think I think an understanding of that in that just patience with, if you really want the relationship building and community engagement, how does that probably not likely pair up with uh, those kinds of other deadlines? Um, to get at your uh, your follow up question about um, uh, I guess institutions and I guess how yeah those past harms inter impact the community building. I think what's interesting about Harvard Forest is that you know it's under this umbrella of Harvard University, but it's in Peter Sam. So we definitely have a disconnect. I definitely won't sugarcoat that. And I, even though we might have faculty, you know, professors from Harvard on site to do their research, um, we still have this really big disconnect between the, these kind of two areas of where the field station is versus uh, the campus. So I and I, I don't have a good solution to that. Um, I, this is definitely something we're working on. We do have winter interns that get that have gotten involved in our project this, this past winter. And January is a good example. Um, and yet, I mean, it's just clear interacting with those students who are actually on campus at that time, talk about that disconnect. And, and you know, the four of us are, you know, the, that are working, that we're working on at this, this um, or five or six of us that are working on it this past winter cannot, cannot solve that. I, I don't have a good solution. Maybe that's something we can do in a follow-up question later, but uh, yeah, there certainly are harms. Museums are part of that, right? Um, we could get off in real tangents here, but <laughs> um, there's a museum at Harvard and there is a museum at Harvard Forest as well, a different kind of museum. But um, yeah, we definitely have to deal with overcoming that harm and being more inclusive uh, and acknowledging and recognizing um, you know, the Native Americans there and, and their role and influence on the landscape. Thanks. Does anyone else have ways that they uh, have addressed or are addressing past harms? Um, this is maybe in part an answer to that question because our, our LTER is new and, and part of my role has been trying to cultivate um, these relationships with communities. And I have a lot of past relationships that I bring to this work of trust that I think is part of what is helping us along. But when I approached a number of my trusted long-term community partners and friends and asked if they would, would wanna be involved, one of the common reactions was, well, I don't wanna work with the university because of past experiences having partnered or worked with the university on projects. So historic harms, but also very specific experiences having worked with researchers. Um, and one of the ways that we addressed that was, you know, we went, back to the drawing board and we said, you know, establishing an advisory group right now of people from the community who we want to work with isn't gonna be possible because we haven't built up that trust and connection. And so um, we ended up saying, you know, we were gonna instead devote at least a year of our time to getting the researchers from the LTER 
research group out into the community to meet with, see, understand what the community is doing on their uh, at different sites. So visiting a community garden, um, visiting the Lower Failing Creek Project, which is an Indigenous-led organization that's reclaiming um, and creating a cultural, a Dakota cultural site at a sacred um, Wakan TP um, cave. And now those relationships are starting to happen between the researchers and um, members of those communities um, outside of anything I, you know, have have to do with. Um, and so that, you know, that was one answer to how we how we talk about that. I want to go back to um, a point that Danielle brought up about how community engaged work takes a lot of time and that often doesn't match with our funding structures or our need to move uh, positions as we um, move in our careers. So um, I'm wondering, and this also addresses uh, Christopher's question in the Q&A, um, who engages with community engaged work at your site? And how do you support that? Are your positions exp explicitly supported and funded to do this type of work? Do you have fellowships? Um, do you have, um, I don't know, RA support? How, who does it and how are they supported? No. <laughs> um, so, so really, um, everyone on our staff is involved in community outreach. Um, some of our funding really does cover a lot of the, um, the meetings that we go to, and that's a big part of growing those community relationships is going to different, so many um, board meetings and collaborative group meetings. Um, and again, listening and kind of learning what what would best serve the different communities. Um, but and and then we have education staff, and that's um, that's the major part of their job is to work within the different schools, um, six different counties in New Mexico. Um, and then even with our university students, um, part of part of their job when they take um, we have a 400, 500 level course at UNM and they learn the ecology of the system, but they also learn um, education, um, outreach, and they work with the different schools that um, monitor our sites. And so part of their role, um, they pay to take the course, but then they get credit for actively engaging in the different schools. Um, and we now have students in our university class that were engaged in monitoring the site of like second graders in Berlin, they get to go back to their second grade school and work with students and tell them, you know, I, I'm from this community and I'm the first person in my family to go to college and you can do this too. And, and so part of that is really, I think just built into our entire program. And while not specifically funded, it, it drives everything we do. So I think it's easy um, for us to justify, yeah, that constant um, engagement with the community. And a policy thing that, that can help if you can get away with it at your site is to stick the community engagement thing in everybody's job description. Because then eventually dollars flow that way, which then lets you do it. Because like, I love getting the phone calls like, hey, can you come walk around at Santa Ana Pueblo looking at dragonflies while we just talk? I'm like, yep, sweet. <laughs> right out the door, just go, go do it. Or there was one time we were on a BEMP site monitoring and the gentleman I was with, um, we just talked cattle drives and uh, planting corn. Um, it didn't have anything rude to do with the site, but that's just where the conversation was wandering. So like having so having that written in as a policy, if this goes into all your job descriptions and people are uncomfortable with community outreach, get them the support and the training they need so they can at least do something with at least one stakeholder, even if it's just that single stakeholder. In, in our case, um, we, we have outside funding we bring in, we leverage funding from, from other projects. And uh, because it started out, you know, I was the only one in education outreach, but now we have more people 
actually researchers interested in in working with um, with different communities, and so so and they bring in also other you know for example we we work with um, foster kids, so we put a, a science camp. We call it fostering science, and so because they don't usually have that opportunity to attend a science camp, and most of these foster kids are Alaska Native uh, students, and and so um, so then you know uh, they come through grants or or for long term. We just had a research symposium for students this uh, past weekend, Friday and Saturday. And so that was, you know, from many different grants, from the GLOBE program, from our NASA project, from the uh, Fresh Eyes on Ice, uh, it's an NSF and, and NASA funded project to support the students and the educators and the community members who are part of monitoring uh, the citizen science community science that they do in their own communities. Um, so, yeah, thanks. Um, we we have community engagement happening across the LTER. So each of the research projects um, has community partners, but they're all at different they're all in different places in terms of how they think about community engagement. And one of the things that um, we are doing with our community engagement team um, is really trying to support that. I, I mentioned some of the ways, but um, we're responding to also what uh, members of those teams and graduate students and, and others say are things that they would like to learn more about. So, you know, bringing in guest speakers. Um, I, I have a monthly kind of office hour that I host on Zoom for anyone in the LTER or partner orgs if they wanna come on and talk about specific community engagement topics or issues. Um, and then we've been doing some tours and site visits to support learning um, of community engagement partners in the project. And then we also have the Bell Museum of Natural History, which is a state natural history museum that's affiliated with the University of Minnesota also does um, a lot of engagement and has an LTER component um, where they're teaching um, on their learning landscape and working with teachers on standardized science education. Um, so uh, we are lucky that um, Dr. Cora Baird is um, uh, not only the um, Virginia LTER site director, but also grew up um, on the Eastern shore. And um, we've been able to work through this COPE grant with a team of um, equally, uh, you know, longstanding, um, wonderful leaders that are more coming from, you know, one is the head of the local YMCA and another is a pastor and organizer. Um, and, uh, and that has been a wonderful amalgamation of various um, types of knowledge. And there's a there's an advisory committee that, that sort of governs the decisions um, made throughout the COPE grant. Um, and, uh, and this has allowed us to focus much more explicitly on issues of um, climate justice than uh, I think the LTER has been able to do in the past. We do a lot of work that is um, the creation of um, online, really pretty, uh, it will, like extremely open to the point where all of the code is online and shareable so anyone can make their, their own versions of, of the work. And then, um, and then local people can uh, keep it up to date. So um, no one has to own software or own the data at all, sorry. Um, and so we are in the process of developing that right now, but as, as everyone has said, it takes a lot of time, not only to build trust, but also to build shared knowledge and then, and then shared platforms for data. Um, and so one thing we did um, was really uh, focus on um, the creation of a platform that's about uh, social data, which wasn't as, as prevalent in the past you know, uh, work that the LTER did. And, uh, and we're now working to slowly weave those things together, the, the sort of social and, um, uh, 
and the ecological. So here's a super scrappy site that um, that we've been co-producing. That's just really about who lives in the Eastern Shore, and and it's based in um, the participatory workshopping we've done so far with our leaders in terms of like, okay, what are the stories you want to tell? And people would be like, well, we know that. There's a disproportionate impact of flooding in terms of who can, um, you know, where the buses can go to pick up kids to take them to school. Like, so getting really specific about um, the burdens borne by um, climate injustice, and uh, and we've been doing that work for a long time um, locally in um, in Charlottesville, or for longer, I suppose I should say. So um, so we have more to draw from there and um, have some interesting. Um, uh, interesting ways that we've been able to fuse deeply qualitative data with with the quantitative, but we're just getting started um, on the Eastern Shore. Um, so we have a question about how your the way you engage with communities has changed um, in the last couple of years um, with the COVID pandemic. And also now that it's becoming um, increasingly common with uh, to have in-person events, um, how how has that experience changed the way that you are um, thinking about how you engage with communities and um, how you do it safely and how do you ensure that you'll have participation um, going forward? Yeah, Daniel. Yeah, you know this is a really interesting question because of COVID and um, I I and I think I mentioned earlier that I things have really come a long way in our relationship building in the past couple of years. And um, it, from my perspective, even before I moved to UBC, I was in Williamsburg, Massachusetts, so Western Massachusetts. And yet my collaborations, um, my group, um, which also includes other research associates at Harvard Forest and has grown to include um, others that are full-time at Harvard Forest and um, including the Director of Outreach and Education. And this, real, even just with our collaborator, a group of collaborators, this was all virtual. So I have my, my uh, you know, good friends and collaborators on this. I've never met in person, but you know, a couple of them, but will in three weeks, which is very exciting. And our relationship building started virtually as well. So that was really challenging, right? That's um, to feel comfortable and pick up, you know, just facial expressions and kind of like energy of people and what and how they're feeling and are they feeling uncomfortable in this conversation or comfortable that's really challenging and I think that definitely held up the process maybe a little bit but really as we've said it's about building trust and so you know and maintaining those those communication lines and being transparent so I think it's it's gone as well as it could have um, in the virtual setting and Throughout the time, if there was anything in person, I wasn't there, but the others that were on site, you know, they could go through a walk through the Harvard Forest site. Um, so that was outdoors. And, and, and now that we're moving to in person, it's, it'll be really interesting um, for me. I have not experienced that during the COVID times in the past couple of years. So I, I, I think a lot of it outdoors, I guess, is, is um, the primary focus for us right now. Um, one thing we did in the pandemic was we pivoted um, to caring less about our research questions um, and more about our partners and um, which, you know, you just have to prioritize and let let some things free on occasion and keeping everybody alive and healthy felt um, like the only thing that mattered. So some of what we did locally was um, our partners and in both grassroots and, and local government said, we need to know where there's burdens being um, borne by people that are having to shelter in place um, based on, you know, do they have food access? Do they have transportation access? So we would co-produce decision support tools that you could make your own meaning, um, but also just that were useful to like, okay, well, where is a pain point that we might not be hearing from people? They may not be accessing the food pantry, but um, but they may be really suffering quietly. And so our, our partners were able to, um, to better apply resources and community organizers often um, in, in to make sure that the people that did have relationships were in community. And then also we made sure the health system's always been um, 
not, you know, there's no trust there at all um, with, with our local health system. And so people didn't want to go get tested uh, for a myriad of really valid reasons. And, um, and so we set up local testing sites with partners at various, you know, kind of community asset, um, uh, you know, hubs in town, and then um, worked with the local food justice organizers to make sure that if you did test positive, you could safely get all the resources you need to uh, shelter in place. Um, and so uh, we, we made ways in which we could make knowledge out of all of this. We, we learned as we grew and we would, um, you know, one of our team uh, who's a medical doctor is now in the White House, COVID, you know, response trying to apply an equity lens. And, you know, it's, uh, there's been ways in which we learned uh, that were useful towards those ends. So I don't think we regret giving up on some of the original scholarly agenda because um, what it gave us in terms of um, uh, of benefit uh, to our local community felt much more important. So sometimes just under under promise, over deliver. Focus on um, what your partners um, what your partners need is is a good uh, COVID and always guide. Um, one of the things that we developed was uh, there was a need for a lot of science. Elena, we I think we have a feedback. Sorry. Oh. I think it's gone. Okay. No. Do you have a feedback? Yeah, maybe try meeting and unmeeting again. Okay. Sorry. It, is it any better? No. Oh, sorry. Okay. I'll just put it in the chat. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry, Ellie. Um, so um, um, I have, um, we have a question about um, how do you start relationships? So one of the themes in the um, uh, core um, sort of values is engaging, that, that we've heard is engaging with respect and listening. So how are some of the ways that um, you or your side have engaged in this process of having the way that you engage with communities be dictated by communities, not so much by um, the academic pursuit. Um, and, and then for someone that is coming in perhaps as a student or as um, a new researcher um, to a new location, how, how would you advise that they tap into these um, structures or um, talk with um, those people that are already there um, to try to to like take advantage of these already established relationships or establish them if they haven't. Um, so because you already brought up um, the listening, when establishing the, the new relationships, um, and this is where that previous question where COVID makes it really difficult, but again, just finding out what the different um, meetings that are happening. So I'll bring up a couple of examples here. Um, the Middle Rio Grande Endangered Species Collaborative Program. Um, we are now a signatory, but even before we were a signatory, we were going to meetings and listening to the different agencies and pueblos and um, non-governmental organizations talk, and you can really get a sense of what people's concerns are. Um, but again, by being that active listener and by engaging with people um, and, and really trying to understand what their concerns are and, and how what assistance looks like for them, um, it's, it's that long game, right? It's slowly building those relationships to the point where you are then invited. Um, and then it's also that balancing of um, understanding where you need to be respectful and let go of those um, research um, priorities. So for example, we had sites historically at four different pueblos and um, at two of them, we were able to monitor their groundwater. And at two of them, they're like, absolutely not. And so we had two sites out of 34 where we don't have groundwater data. 
And then the Pueblo said, hey, you're, you're collecting the data, but we prefer if you didn't share it. And so we're able to learn from it and we share the data directly with the Pueblo. But if anyone else is interested in their data, it's respecting that data sovereignty. They have to go directly to the Pueblo and say, hey, can we look at, at the data that were collected by, um, by them? But it's even being able to serve their needs without collecting all the data we collect at other sites, it's still more important that we are listening and able to support them without um, dictating what we want to learn from, from their site. And so it is that, that slow being respectful and eventually you're able to establish those, those connections. And there can be a lot of unindoctrinating new staff as part of our onboarding process, right? You get new folks in that come from a range of backgrounds, but if they're coming in from like the academic mindset, it's very really hard to like, you know, I still fall in that trap. Like I'm majorly clear, but you know, but I still fall in that trap. Oh, gotta go do this, you know, super straight white academic thing. I'm like, oh, that's bad, right? So, but it's constantly checking in and also checking what, what are your internal policies that might inhibit a uh, community mindset and then shifting those and then like having an onboarding process that is sort of a gentle, but could be rough if needed, kind of undoctrinating that, that kind of mindset and making sure it's all written down so people can have it for continuity. We, um, we have a guidebook uh, that exists on in our shared LTER drive as a living document that is kind of a orientation to the program and has, um, you know, diagrams of um, the research teams and best practices for field work. And then we have a community engagement section in that. And I may try to copy and paste some of that into the chat so you can see what it says, but it kind of, it, it, it's not best practices because we're, we don't really have that framework, <laughs> but um, but it does have some pointers for new researchers or new research projects and sort of how to orient in a in a way. So I'll I'll grab some of that language and paste that into the chat. And then it also sorry it also talks about the different resources within our project for supporting um, researchers on community engagement projects. So. And then. Um, just to be mindful of the time, uh, one other important tenant of um, uh, responsible community engaged work is checking in and, and um, coming back to communities. So how do you center that? Um, how do you make sure that the events and the formats um, in which you give back to community are accessible and are actually serving the um, needs of the community and also the desire for the type of feedback or type of information they want from engaging with you and your with your shared work. Yeah, Danielle. Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, and I, I think this goes back to what I mentioned earlier about transparency. And um, I think just being really clear about what's happening and any any plans is with and what's interesting is, you know, like this, for this upcoming summer, for example, for the RU summer program, and um, we have two students on our group project working with the Nimuk Nation, and we don't have, you know, I'm, I'm sure this, this is like this mindset does not sit well with a lot of people, which is, what are we doing for the summer? Well, we don't really know at the moment, <laughs> right? Like, because it depends on conversations. It depends on what we work out in. Like others have said, you know, asking questions and listening and, and figuring out what their needs are and what they want to do. So it's, and, I, and you know, I, I think if you're okay with that kind of uncertainty, that then that's okay. Uh, and then you'll be kind of, you'll be good at kind of ease into this community engagement kind of mindset with it. Um, and uh, losing my train of thought here in the, in the Q&A. Um, yeah, so it's, um, yeah, what was your question again? <laughs> Sorry. You're muted. Sorry. Um, yeah, like how do you circle back and like make sure that you are fulfilling sort of your part of um, the responsibility and relationship? Um, yeah. With yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's right. It started with uh, transparency and 
And we, we talk a lot, right? We talk often. I think we've gotten to a point now it's, um, that it's friendly, right? And it's, it's no longer of kind of when we hop on to a Zoom call, it's, are we feeling comfortable today? How can we address some of these questions? And now it just has a flow to it. Um, and, and I said, if you just really kind of uphold to that, you know, being respectful and transparent and then asking how they feel about it. There have been instances where, um, you know, having met with, with leaders from that community and being surprised, I think, kind of going into a meeting and making sure we had that mindset, but then they asked what we wanted to do, you know, so I think it's just come to a place and there's no, unfortunately, no shortcut to that. And, and you know, how to, um, it's, it's, you just have to be committed to it. I think you have to have kind of this mindset and, and being committed to the process. Shall I try? Yeah, how is it now? Again. So, um, yeah, like Danielle said, uh, first, there, there are growing pains in, in this relationship building. And, but first, we, we honor you know, the, the indigenous knowledge first instead of in the, in the past where we always start with Western science. Everything starts with Western science. Now we start with in what do they want? How do they want to start it and have them feel comfortable? Everybody has a voice you know, through personal introductions, scheduling the time of the event also matters, whether it coincides or misses their subsistence uh, events so that they are free and able to attend fully. And, and so, you know, there are many things to consider in this, uh, where we do our part of listening, including, you know, the timing so that we do not exclude uh, those who are who need to work, who, do, who need to do their subsistence uh, activities at a certain time of the year. I think that's a, a great place to wrap up. Um, I really want to thank all the panelists and um, and Christy for managing the Q and A. Um, this is, I think, really insightful, especially for everyone in, interested in getting involved with with uh, community outreach. So we really appreciate that. And um, also want to thank the LTR network office and the DEI committee. Um, yeah, so thank you all so much. And uh, hopefully you all leave here energized to like go out into your community, community and figure out what we need to do in order to increase those connections. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Good meeting you, Danielle. And Barb yeah, and Shana. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Era and Kim. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Bye.